minds and in our lives and in this place, God. Father, we pray that as the word is going forth, Lord, that you would renew our minds, that it would transform us inside and out, God. And Father, we pray that we would truly be satisfied with you, that we would truly be satisfied with you, with just you, with your presence, with your spirit, with what you have to offer us, God, with just you, with just you. Father, we thank you. We bless your holy name in this place, God. We exalt your name on high, God. We magnify your name, God. You deserve the glory. We lift you up, God. We praise your holy name, and we thank you in advance, God. We thank you in advance, Lord, for what you are going to do in this place, Lord, in us and through us. Father, we thank you. We lift up Apostle Pam. We lift up our leaders, Apostle Teresa, God. We, we bless your name for our leaders, God, and we thank you that you have chosen us to be a part of this vision, God. We pray to you, not because we are worthy, but in Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen, amen, hallelujah. Father, we just praise you. We thank you for this word. Thank you for the prayer, all of the service that we have um, experienced up to this point. We are so, 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 so very grateful and on behalf of Apostle Teresa Harvard Johnson and the Scribal Conservatory we want to welcome those of you here in the audience and also those of you that are visiting with us fellowshipping with us enjoying the Lord with us virtually we just praise God amen amen praise God we want to say happy birthday to our leader Apostle Teresa, we are so, so, so honored and blessed um, to be a part of this vision and to share her seeing another year. And we are just praising God for all that is to come. We are excited to be able to partner and, and see um, the progress of all that God is doing. We are so um, honored and privileged. We thank God for your life, Apostle Teresa. We are very grateful and privileged. Now, we are so um, excited. We've been studying about the salt covenant and uh, salt and light. And if you're salty, I hope that you have been um, impacted by this word because it's really important. This is one of the foundational messages that God wants to impart to his people. And for those of you that have missed it, please, please, please go online and allow, uh, go to the uh, Scribal Conservatory YouTube page, and you can see all this goodness, not just because I'm preaching it, but all of the um, lessons that we have um, experienced up until this point. I really believe that God really has something for us to receive. So we are excited, grateful for all that he is doing, and I want to um, just uh, thank our team, those that are virtual in here. Uh, we praise God. Praise God for the worship today. Amen. So if we remember, we'll go back and I'll do just a, a quick review of all that the Lord has been depositing in us. We've been talking about salt and how he has um, really given us an idea. I, I appreciate it. I stated in the last lesson how um, he was recruiting hard, but he did it in wisdom. Here he was um, it came out, he had just been tempted of the enemy. This is Matthew 4. And then he chose um, a few of his disciples. And then he came back and in power, he began to minister to the people. But before he did that, he fed them because they were hungry. they in the wilderness. He fed them and he healed them. So he was setting a precedent for us to be able to do the same. As he taught them, he began to tell them, blessed are ye, and he had eight different principles that he um, taught them, but we have not fully understand, understood the uh, full definition of what blessed means. You know, we always say we blessed and highly favored, but really in that situation, he was saying, when you are blessed, when you go through these principles, it means that 
you are fully satisfied. And I'm hoping that we have begun to really embrace understanding what fully being satisfied is because for the most part, if we're honest, we haven't been fully satisfied. You know, some days we love the Lord and some days we just like, okay. But there's a consistency of being fully satisfied in him. Now, when he began to teach this, he was letting them know, I'm here, I'm here, I am here. And he went about Galilee teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That was Matthew 4, um, 23. So he begins to introduce what it means to be in the kingdom. And as he's introducing these uh, principles, everything sounds good until he gets down to one of the verses where it says, you're fully satisfied when men talk about you when they say all kind of evil against you, when you can go through being this persecuted one and still come out praising the Lord. You are fully satisfied then. Then he talks about, he changes direction. He says, but you're salt. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He begins to impart what it means to be salty. So at that point, you may have tried to understand what it was that he was talking about. Um, he always talks to the people in a language that they will understand. Because they have been uh, in livestock and harvesting and all these other things, dealing with the spices, even as we review the Old Testament, he understood that, let me say something that they'll understand. So not too far away was the Dead Sea. Um, so he begins to use this, this symbolism of salt now, the Dead Sea is the saltiest body of water on earth, and nothing can flourish there but salt. If you want to swim in it, you wouldn't drown. It just, you would just float, float. But now what happens is, is that when the Lord decides that he wants to really make a point, he begins to dive in. So we, we found out on last week um, in Luke 14 and 34, if, if you are... You are the salt of the earth, but if you lose your flavoring, how can it be seasoned? And salt is good, but if you lost it, say you're good for nothing. So he says, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. So today, we're going to kind of continue that um, lesson. We're going to talk about um, the covenant of salt. So as we begin to dig, and I'm encouraging you, all of you to really get into what he's saying about the salt. There's so much in there, and there's so much that he wants us to understand. We need to go back a little bit. So here we are. This is what is the conservatorian's conservator, and these are our measure, and we just praise God that these are things that we have studied. And as we are looking at these, we will see that as we become salty, we'll transform nations, we'll reinforce the covenant. We're always elevating Christ above men, and we increase in understanding. So we don't talk a lot about covenants today. It's almost a bad word, but we should because covenants are one of the most important themes in the Bible. They are the key to God's redemptive plan to restore humanity to its divine calling. Starting in Genesis, God enters into one formal partnership after another with various humans in order to rescue his world. These divine human partnerships drive the narrative forward until it reaches its climax in Jesus. To tell the story of God redeeming humanity through Jesus is to tell the whole story of God's covenantal relationship with humans. And now we know if, if ever there was a tragedy, we would get um, these different teams to go in and rescue them. Like if there is a, a, an earthquake or something and people are trapped. So you send out the teams to, that have the specialized equipment to get those people there in need. God had his own rescue plan set aside when, when he automatically sent, well, created mankind. Adam failed. And so at that point, God said, okay, I got to have a, a rescue plan. This one is not working. So let's identify what a covenant is. Almost all of us are in covenant today. All of us are in covenant today in some form or another. Maybe on your jobs, um, you signed an agreement, amen. You did something and you knew that 
you had to perform the rites of the covenant. You also knew that um, a covenant involves two or more parties. Amen. And it must be based on the full knowledge of all parties regarding obligations and commitments. It must be written down or fully comprehended. It's entered into consciously by choice, not by force. Nobody forcing you to sign that agreement. You know, when you get to work, you want it to work, so you sign that agreement. Um, it's established for purpose. So, for example, the king would promise certain protections, and the subject would be promised would promise loyalty to the king. So every covenant outlines what needs to happen between the two parties. There are promises, and then there are obligations. There, there are protections and then there's loyalty. So when you think of covenant, you might think of the following words, a vow, a pledge, an agreement, an arrangement, bargain, a bond, commitment, contract, deal, deed, handshake, trust, transaction, treaty, engagement, promise, oath, pact, constitution, testament and partnership. So that about covers it. And you may be able to add a few other definitions, but this is what covenant means. It means that one, well, it has to be at least two people, two parties that enter into an agreement for a desired outcome. So when I looked at this, I was surprised. You know, sometimes we think we know a little bit about the Bible, but when you start studying, all these things start coming out. And so what I found out was there are seven foundational covenants of the Bible. So while there are many types of covenants in the Bible, for example, there's personal covenants, there's individual covenants, there's marital covenants, political, relational, and legal, God enters into one form of partnership after another with various people in order to rescue his creation. So these divine human partnerships drive the narrative forward until it reaches its climax in Jesus. He didn't do anything just haphazard. He um, has a plan. So it starts out with the Adamic Edenic um, covenant. He tells them, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion, you're priests and kings. And this is in Genesis 1, um, 26 through 30, 2, 16, 17, that God would bring redemption. Even after the fall, he made a promise. He said, the offspring of the woman is going to bring deliverance. So we have to keep that in the back of the mind. Every woman since um, Eve I don't know, maybe they were watching to see if the promised one would come, but it wasn't until the fullness of time that Jesus began to make his appearance. After that, it was the Noahic, Noah's uh, covenant. God promised that he wouldn't destroy the whole world by a flood. And to this very day, we see that there's a rainbow that reflects God's promise. He didn't lie, and he hasn't gone back on his word. The rainbow was a sign that God says, I keep my promise. I will not destroy the whole world anymore by a flood. I'm sanctifying you. I'm setting you apart. The Abrahamic covenant says, I'm going to make you a great nation. All families, in, all families in you will be blessed. That requires circumcision. That requires sanctification. That requires being set apart. He keeps revealing these same um, tenets of what he wants in, in the covenant. The Mosaic covenant reminded them his covenant with Abraham. The blessings and the curses of Deuteronomy 28 remain set apart. Keep the Sabbath holy and enjoy the day of rest. The Davidic covenant, Saul failed. He was supposed to follow all of this, but he failed. So David succeeded in van vanquishing God's enemies and restoring order. David's desire was for him to build, he wants to build God a house. In response, God promised that there would never be an end to his lineage sitting upon the throne forever. Now, when I looked at this particular scripture, I said, okay, so you made a promise to David and you can't lie. So are you telling me that Benjamin Netanyahu is your seed and all those before him were the promised seed of David, that you promised David that there would not be one person that would sit on his throne? No, I found out different. Come on, let's go. So there's another, here's the, here's the sixth covenant. God makes a new covenant because all the other ones fail. Unlike the one which Israel had broken, this coming day would bring forgiveness of sin internal renewal of the heart, and an intimate knowledge of God. 
So he begins to bring in the high, high priest so that we will have someone. Before the high priest, they would, they would fail. If they come before the Lord to make repentance for the people, if they weren't right, there was, um, they would tie a rope around the, the priest's leg or, or foot, and he would go in to repent on behalf of the people. He would get into the Holy of Holies, and if he didn't have all of his stuff covered, they will be dragging him out because sin could not be before the Lord. So here God is in his plan. In this new covenant, he's sending Jesus. And he is the perfect sacrifice. He is the perfect high priest. And he begins to tell us that I've sent somebody that will throw your bomb, that will make it right, that can forgive your sin, that you can be washed by his sacrifice. And he may die, but he lives forever. So after all of that, there's an everlasting covenant, the one in which we're enjoying right now, the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The new and everlasting covenant is a contractual agreement in which God and man agree to abide by certain terms and conditions in return for certain benefits. So a man agrees to keep all of God's commandments and observe every ordinance of salvation. B, God in return agrees to share with man all the blessings and benefits of eternal life. So can you see it? God preserved the world through Noah, initiated redemption through Abraham, established the nation of Israel through Moses, promised an eternal shepherd king through David, and then fulfilled all of his covenants through Jesus. All of every promise that he made, he fulfilled it in Christ. So the promise of Jesus, a righteous Messiah and king, would reign and fulfill the Davidic royal covenant and Old Testament prophecies. And there were a lot of prophecies saying that he would come, that he would be the one that has been sent by God, and that he would fulfill everything that God said. That's amazing because how many of us have fulfilled everything God said? Not always. We might try, you know, we used to uh, uh, play this game as a, as a child. Put your left foot in, take your left foot out. Uh, Y'all remember that? Shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey. We've been hokey pokeying. But I want you to know that there was nothing shaky about the Lord. He was steadfast. He was unmovable. And he did what God commanded him to do. And because of his, his unwavering commitment to obey God in the midst of everything. So when he was saying, you know, uh, when you're persecuted for righteousness sake, when you're going through all these things, when you don't like what's happening, he said, I've already took care of that. Watch me. Watch how I do it. See how I overcome. So it's not that there's any temptation that's been given to man that, that will overtake us, but we can be victorious in Christ if we want to stop doing the hokey pokey. Okay. So here's a little history and specificity. We're talking about the covenant of salt today. And every offering, this is Leviticus 2, 13, and every offering of your grain offering, you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So this was a mandate. They had to salt their offerings. Ezekiel 43, 24 says, When you offer them before the Lord, the priest shall throw salt on them, and they will offer them up as a burnt offering to the Lord. Numbers 18 and 19. While the animal sacrifice was dead, the presence of salt symbolized the life of the one making the sacrifice. And just as God used sacrifice, used salt in the sacrifice as a picture of an everlasting sacrifice, he also used this phrase to speak of an everlasting priesthood. You see, he's got, he's, he has a method. He, he has a purpose to all of this. He's showing us through types and shadows of the Old Testament what it means when we see what a real covenant is in Christ. All the heave offerings of the holy things, which the children of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given you and your sons and your daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever. 
before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. Now, we, hate, we don't pay much attention to that word forever because we kind of gloss over it, but I would encourage you to go through the scriptures and look at, at the things that he said forever about, that these were his covenants. We may not want it, we may not accept it, but these are things that he instituted by saying, this is my covenant, and this is going to be my covenant forever. To your sons, to your daughters, you guys can partake of it. You can enter into agreement with me, but this is what I say. So in most biblical instances, the heave offering was part of a sacrifice set aside or lifted up for a higher purpose. The heave offering was often given in conjunction with tithes. Leviticus 7:14:34 as a provision for the Levites, the priestly tribe who did not have land of their own and therefore could not grow their own food, they depended on the Lord's provision through tithes and heave offerings. So what he is saying is, these are your offerings. You're going to salt these offerings, whatever it is. It could be the thigh of the animal or the breast of the animal. You're going to lift it up. It's, it's heave. Heave means to lift up. Then they would also have the wave offering that they would wave it before the Lord. He's saying, whatever you lifting up and whatever you waving at, I want salt on it. And we have to really understand that the provision of what he is saying really means something to us in our day. So no, we're not going to come up here and throw salt on our dollar bills, you know, in our offering. That's not what this is is no he's not asking us to go through those kind of things but the giving that we're supposed to and we haven't forgotten we're going to encourage you to give the thing about it is in in the giving it's a heart posture so he's saying how salt how salty are you are you salty enough to loose that money or those possessions are you salty enough to be obedient in what i've commanded you to do so there were seven blessings of the salt covenant one is preservation of the promises of God. That's Ephesians 2 and 12. Preserved from decay. We can see decay all around us everywhere. And our bodies, we ain't going to live forever. We're not. Uh-oh. Did I say something? We're not going to live forever. Amen. Our outward man is decaying every day, but the inward man should be renewed day by day. But there's a preservation of God so that the, the, from decay means that our, our, our inward man does not have to be um, full of decay, should not be. He preserves community like Abraham did Lot. Lot had no business, let me tell you, so Abraham is Lot's uncle. He was always following Abraham around because why? Abraham is blessed. And they got so blessed until he said, listen, the land can't handle both of us. Let's, it's, it's too tight here. So whatever, here's some land over here. Here's some land over here. Whichever place you choose, go. I bless you. So he went to the best land, of course. You know, relatives do that. He went to the best land, but Abraham was blessed. God had already said, in your seed, I'm going to make all nations blessed. In you, you hold the blessing for the world. Can you imagine that God is saying, the blessing of the whole world will come through you? So here he is, Lot doing something he ain't got no business. He went and got in some trouble. Got with some people that didn't like him. I nap. Abraham had to sell up, take his folks, and go get him. Had to find him, get the people that took him, and then bring him back to safety. So why was that important? Because that's covenant. You know we fight for what we love. Don't mess with my stuff. Don't mess with my kids. Don't mess with my grandkids. You know how we are about family. We will fight somebody because of covenant. Because of covenant. So it preserves community. Number two is seasons. This salt seasons. Makes bland food taste good. And our seasoning of the salt that God provides for us is for us to make a difference. People shouldn't be able to come into our presence and leave the same way. We are the influencers of this world, for real. It brings friendship, the breaking of bread. It brings dominion, promised to David forever. That was... Uh, the breaking of bread, I'm sorry, Acts 2, 42. The seasoning, Colossians 4 and 6. And dominion, 2 Chronicles 13 and 5. We are making the PowerPoints available so you'll be able to follow these scriptures. Healing. Elisha heals the water. We're going to talk about this next week. 
the water was bad, the water was defiled. Nothing was growing there. The people were happy, but nothing can happen. The food, they're just, if your water's bad, your food ain't good. They, the women were barren, they were miscarrying, they couldn't have babies because of, the, because of um, the defilement. But these were the blessings of the salt covenant. It brought healing, it brings deliverance, it brings stability. Now there was such a thing as a salt war, and God commanded Abimelech to go and defeat this, this um, country. And when he defeated them, okay, he killed up all your enemy, but what did he do? God commanded him to let this be a salt of where he went and took salt and spread it all over their vegetation. Why? Because it had to cut it off. And none gonna grow here. We defeated you. We don't want nothing else rising up. Nobody's sneaking out. They may have, have we, maybe we didn't get them and they sneaking out to try to find some food. No, that's not gonna happen. Everything was decimated. Salt destroys that which is not profitable to God. Salt represents life and the person presenting a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 through 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. So he's given us. And then he says, after you've gone through that, don't be conformed to this world. Salt transforms you so that you can prove what the good and the perfect will of God is. We need that. The salt covenant provided blessings for the obedient. It heals. For the disobedient, there were grave consequences. Salt calls for a sacrificial how much you love. How much you love God. Salt is a perpetual, everlasting, permanent part of the covenant. So salt is dying to self. The covenant is living to life. So the last couple of weeks, Apostle was teaching us about are we alive? Or are we dead? So covenants can be also symbolized purity, perfection, wisdom, hospitality, durability, and fidelity. We, these are things especially you will see like in some wedding ceremonies. They have a salt uh, covenant and they take, the bride takes some salt and puts it in a little container. The, the uh, groom takes his salt and puts it in the same container and they mix it up. And you can't tell their, what they gave um, each other. You know how a lot, of, a lot of times, you know, in our covenants, we try to pull out our own grain of salt. Say, no, this is mine. Don't go through a divorce or a separation. This, you can't pull that salt out. I'll leave that alone. If someone changes their mind about honoring the covenant, it was termed as spilling the salt. I want to show y'all something. You can't see it on the screen here. But in your mind, and I want you to check this out when you get home, those of you that are here in the sanctuary. Um, Leonardo da Vinci, famous painting of the Lord's Supper. I want you to check it out. In this picture of the Lord's Supper, they're trying to say, you know, he, the Lord has already said, one of you going to betray me. And they're looking at one another and trying to figure out but in this painting, I think that um, the artist understood that when there is betrayal, that it is done by spilling the salt. When you leave here, go blow up that picture of the Lord's Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. You will see Judas with the bag. You know, he had the bag. But you'll see some salt spilt. So when you understand, it's right there. It blew me away too. It's right there. So when you start seeing, when things come, <laughs> when you start seeing things that really portray what, what's happening in life, uh, we see it everywhere. On the job, there's betrayal. In politics, there's betrayal. In the church, it's betrayal. All kinds of, so when you see that, God is, Considering that is someone spilling the salt, meaning they didn't count it worthy. They didn't value his covenant. He didn't value it. But oh, it don't matter because you know what? Here comes Jesus. He's the promise. And when your days be fulfilled, you shall sleep with your fathers, and I will set up your seed after thee. 
This is the promise. We shall proceed out of your body and will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house shall be established and your kingdom forever before you. Even your throne shall be established forever. So this is God prophesying um, through um, the prophet Samuel to David saying, I'm going to establish your throne. Your, it's, it's, it will be established forever. I'm establishing your kingdom. I'm going to build me a house, blah, blah, blah. But many thought that he was speaking of Solomon. We know Solomon did. He did a lot of stuff. But he wasn't the one God was talking about. This one is a kingdom that's established forever. Solomon died. But the kingdom that he's talking about is listed here. Now, you know every time there's a promise, and every time, let's say the parents have a will, and in the will they designate certain ones to get a certain amount of property, possessions, money, whatever it is. And when people think there's something of value, folks will lose their mind and fight. Here it is in, in the scriptures. Here's the fight. Now, these, these are David's relatives. And Abijah stood up upon Mount Zamaram, I don't know, I messed that up. Anyway, which is in Mount Ephraim, and said, O Jeroboam and all Israel, hear you me. Ought you not to know that the Lord God of Israel has given the kingdom over Israel to forever, even to him and to his sons by covenant of salt? This thing is, is it's sealed. This is what God promised. This is a covenant of salt, and he gave it to David. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, is risen up and has rebelled against the Lord. So you see all these cast of characters, somebody trying to get the kingdom. And they don't even know it. It don't even belong to them. So here's the fulfillment. This is what Gabriel um, told Mary in Luke 1, 32 and 33. For lo, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Now, she, the angel is talking about Jesus. And they would, the Pharisees at one point would ask Jesus, Who, who are you? Whose son are you? you who? You can't, you can't be David and God's son. But they didn't, have, they didn't know the revelation. So, here we are. Here comes Jesus. He's the promised Messiah. He is the fulfillment of God's promise, the fulfillment of the covenant. So here he is. And I'm going to give you, this is Hebrews 7, 11 to 26. And if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. So this gives the history. It says, therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? There would be no purpose for that. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood, and it is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. All those commandments and the things that God instituted is back in the Old Testament. The people failed time and time again. They could not just do right. The law didn't make anything perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope. We have this better covenant through which we draw near to God. 
And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath, there's that covenant, by him the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety. He's our guarantee of a better covenant. You have to have a signatory. You have to have someone that can enforce the covenant. So here is Jesus saying, hey, I'm the one. I got it. This is me. It's about me. I'm going to bring you all in. He says, also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchanging priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I am so glad that he still is making intercession for me. I don't know about y'all. I have needed him to intercede for me. And I can look at this promise. Part, that's part of, my, of the covenant, the better promise. He says, don't worry. I am interceding for my people. You come through God. You come to God through me. And since you're doing that, I am, I am ever living. I live to intercede for you. For so, now, of the high priest, they can't intercede all day, all night. They, you know, they can't. And some things he just, just because he is who he is, his life answers and asks God, Lord, okay, I made the sacrifice. What you say about this? He ever lives to make the manifestation of the covenant true for us. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled separate from the sinners. Now, if that's a declaration, decree, we need to say, I am holy, harmless, undefiled. That's what the salt does. Did y'all hear that? That's what the salt does. He who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. This is what they're speaking about him. And has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness. But the word of the oath, the word of the covenant, which came after the law, appoints the son who has been perfected, there's that word, forever. Not just one time. Hebrews 8, 7 through 13. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, brand new, with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord, for this is the covenant, y'all listen to this good news, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and I will be their God. Can you see that if we don't have the mind of Christ and it's not written on our hearts, we can't be, he can't be our God. How can he rule over something you won't even understand? And they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And that, he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now that is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. That's Hebrews 8, 7 to 13. So the old covenant, there were foundations he used to build upon. But now that we're in this new covenant, this everlasting covenant, these are some of the things that we can um, love and understand about his provision for us. So Ephesians 2, 12 contains all of these divine promises and benefits to be obtained in Christ. Jesus was the promised Messiah of salvation. Jesus was the promised King of heaven. Jesus was the one who would grant the righteous the promised land with eternal life. And Jesus was the promised fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies. Now, when we talk about Jesus, some of you all can't see, 
what's on the screen. But when you think about all that he is, you, have, you may have your own little pet definition of what he is. We have, he's everlasting father, he's the branch, he is the I am, the almighty, the Christ, uh, the judge, the prince of peace, the savior, the alpha omega, the word, the bread of life, the master. But you have your own specific thing. When you say Lord or Jesus, that means something to you. Now for me, it means friend. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. <laughs> no, not one. Who can heal our soul's diseases? No, not one. So when I think about what he means to me, all of these, all of this is good. But there's some days when I really need a friend, and he's my friend. Because he came in my place. So true friends, I don't know if y'all have true friends, but true friends can be like family. And they will fight too. They will fight for you. They are there. Friends, like they say, closer than a brother. I have some of them. I praise God. Please don't, please don't, please don't fight somebody and they got friends. That's all I got to say. That's all I got to say. He is our friend in all these different things, but it's because he's our friend, he made sure that we came into the covenant with him. So, you know, they used to have a commercial that said a certain card had its privileges, but there's nothing that has more privileges than this covenant. So the promises associated with the new covenant includes the following. We got the promise of the Holy Spirit. We got the promise of Jesus, the righteous Messiah and King, that would reign and fulfill the Davidic royal covenant and all the Old Testament prophecies. You know, sometimes people can, can give you a word and you might still be waiting on the word. It may not be that it was something that you didn't do. Maybe it was just that the word wasn't the word. It went what God was saying. I remember, I'll give you this story. I got a word that, because I like to cook, I like to feed people, um, I got a word from somebody that liked my cooking that I was going to have a restaurant and a grocery store. So, no. That's not, that's not, you know, sometimes he answers your heart. And I can agree that sometimes the Lord does say something that we might not automatically, you know, agree with. You know, he's sovereign. He can do and say whatever. But that just didn't resonate with my spirit. Ten years later, no. Sometimes, you know, but the thing about the Lord and his covenant promises that he spake is real. And the word that he spake is true. It will not return void. If he said it, it's going to come to pass. All right. So salvation by grace with forgiveness of sins. And also another part of the privileges that we have. God promises to be the personal God and the saved and to, and to be with us. The promise of eternal life with Jesus Christ. That's another privilege. The promise of rest in Christ by the benefits of salvation. That's another privilege. So what I want us to understand is that because we're in this covenant, that we need to be grateful. I have never seen so many ungrateful Christians in my life. Gosh, we just, we don't, uh, and not just ungrateful, entitled. There's, I'm just like, listen, we, we got to be, do you understand? The Lord of the, the creator of the universe has chosen us and allowed us to come into this covenantal relationship. We get all of these benefits and we still frowning? My thing is you can't, you cannot come into Jesus and stay the same. It's just impossible. Not, not, not the real Jesus. Religion, yeah. But the real Jesus, no. So God's purpose, by the blood of this everlasting covenant seasoned with salt, Jesus is the greater son of David. Jesus seasons us with moral flavor of his character that preserves and purifies our lives and keeps us from corrupting ourselves and others. That's if you stay close. This truth is worked out through Jesus' sacrifice for our sin, through his role as our great high priest, and through his rule over our lives. Acts 1 and 8. His impartation of the Holy Spirit anoints and empowers us to live that salty life. How can we do it otherwise? We can't. 
God's plan was to reveal himself on earth through his people. He wants a people who he can live his life through, a people who will salt the earth. You are the salt of the earth. How are you influencing? How are you salting it? How are you um, preserving those things that need to be preserved and destroying those things that need to be destroyed? Where do you think the persecution is going to come from? Because you're destroying some things that need to be destroyed. People aren't just fighting you because they know something is in there that's coming to attack that which is against God. He's calling up people who will enter into a salted blood covenant with him. He don't want no offering that's not salted in him. Our holy life should make people thirsty for him. When we live a worldly lifestyle, we betray the salt. We spill in that salt. So every day we need to ask ourselves to make sure that we shore it up, that we're walking worthy in the covenant, that we are not walking unworthy that we are not spilling the salt. When we compromise, we lose our saltiness. We betray our Lord. The salt of the kingdom is not a self-generating salt. You can't make your own salt because you're, you're gonna mix it up with some salt. You're gonna mix, it'll be like the Dead Sea. Can't none live in it. You know, you got a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of your opinion. A little bit of the Lord and, you know, the opinions of men. He's saying, I can't have any mixture. I want you to be for real with me and understand that there is blessings over here or consequences over there. When we lose our saltiness, we would betray our Lord. The salt of the kingdom is not self-generating. He salts us. He makes us salt. But it is our responsibility to maintain it. When he said in the scripture, have salt, of your, have salt in yourself. So once he, he salts you and continuously um, pulling off the things of this world, uh, purging us of things that don't benefit the kingdom, we don't lose that ground. We continue to keep that in a place that is worthy um, of his honor. Holy Spirit keeps us salty. So he says, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, if you, if you remain in this salted place, ask me, ask me. You got some things you want to ask the Lord? How's your salt content? How are you filling up with the things of the Lord? What about the word? What, do you, what is he preserved in your life? Preserves our whole life, not just in our life, preserves our life. What are the things that he wants to destroy? What are the things that he wants to flavor and season? What is he trying to protect you from? That you're going over the boundaries of his counsel. So he has saying that, listen, if, my, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, ask me what you will. Because he's a promise keeper. He keeps his covenant. And he really wants us to get to a place that we understand and fully embrace all that he has for us. Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege of entering into this covenant. You've explained to us about this covenant of salt, how nothing that we offer, even our whole lives, this, this sacrifice, we say that we're sacrificing our life to you, but Father, part of it is not fully salted because we're not fully satisfied. You told us we'd be blessed if we were fully satisfied. Hedge us up into your spirit. Help us to understand. Oh, Help us to get to the place, Father, where we are pursuing the salt, pursuing the overflow. We often sing the song, fill me up till I overflow. But God, there's some emptiness. God, in the name of Jesus, are asking that there is something that you would continue to guide us and lead us into this covenant. You commanded us to be salty. You commanded us. And we've put salt with mixture with excuses, with things that don't benefit the kingdom. 
So this salt that sanctifies us, that purifies us, that keeps us in a place of holiness, this salt that guides us. And, and Father, we're asking for every place that is not full, that you would fill it up for your glory. We want to glorify you in the fullness. We want to show forth your glory because we embrace all the tenets of the covenant, all your promises. Forgive us when we wanted your promise and not fulfill our part of the covenant. So today we fully, fully, fully stand again. We surrender our lives again to you. We repent for every time we've been distracted, every time our conversations haven't been right, our thought processes, we, we repent, God, for every time that we have let you down, you had an expectation on our lives, and we moonwalked right out of your purpose. Father, we repent for every time. Not, Father, that we just crying, but we are asking, Father, for a change of heart and a change of mind. You promised in your word. You said you will write your word on our heart. Hearts. Yes. Oh, glory, God, right on us. Oh, God, get in our ears, Lord. We've been hearing the wrong thing. We've been hearing everything except your voice. Seeing everything, everything, God, except you. Oh, that we might focus on you because when we look at you, we are transformed. Ha, we can behold you and stay the same. Hallelujah. Say, Borabasaya. We can behold you and stay the same. We can behold you and stay the same. So, Father, give us the right focus. Father, give us the right ears to hear. You said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the scripture has said to the church. You're speaking to us. You always are speaking, God. You even revealed a while back that the church has given you the cold shoulder. But God, I pray that you would allow us to bow our knees to you once again. That we would be humble and that we would understand the importance of where you've called us. That we're to be salt and light. I thank you, God, for what you're doing and the stirring even now, Father, for those under the sound of my voice. I thank you for the convicting power, God. I thank you, Father, that you're highlighting. Every place, I don't know, every backslidden place, God. Every backslidden place, God. Every place where we have not been agreeing to your covenant. Every place, God. God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for bowing every knee. You said every knee will bow, every tongue confess that you are God. And we thank you today for giving us another chance. We thank you today. I thank you, Father. Hallelujah for the heart and hearts that you're breaking up the fallow ground. I thank you in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, God, for breaking up. I thank you for breaking it up. I thank you for breaking it up. In the name of Jesus, thank you for regulating minds today. Every confusion we rebuke in Jesus' name. I thank you, God, every wayward mind, every confused mind. Hallelujah. You said let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus Father we just thank you thank you for the stir thank you for the stir thank you for the stir thank you for stirring us to righteousness thank you God in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus I thank you for being the glory and the lifter of our head I thank you for being our mighty fortress thank you for being our savior thank you God I thank you for healing even right now in the name of Jesus oh God we thank you that you're the healer thank you that you're the healer thank you that you're the healer move by your spirit in the name of Jesus I thank you for moving entire bodies we thank you for regulating 
thank you for regulation huh? according to your will God in the name of Jesus thank you hallelujah thank you for healing bodies God even headaches we come against them in Jesus name we come against the headaches now hallelujah we thank you for the healing coming right now in the name of Jesus God right now chest pains lung problems stomach intestines come into full alignment in the name of Jesus every organ to every organ to function as it was created in heaven Thank you for your deliverance today, God. Thank you for deliverance today. To that person that is down, God, we speak to the darkness. We speak and we lose the light. Darkness can't comprehend. Darkness overtake. Thank you for it today. Thank you for making us salty. We receive the outpouring of the soul covenant, the manifestation of your glory, the fulfillment in Christ. We receive it now. Thank you for putting away the old covenant. It was useless, God. Thank you for calling us into a new covenant. This new everlasting covenant. There is no end. There's no expiration date. It's not going to perish. Thank you, God. There have been dark documents, God, where names have been written. But you washed it away. All the accusations, all the lies. God, you wiped that away with your blood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How privileged we are. How blessed we are. How blessed we are. How fully satisfied we are. Fully satisfied. Fully satisfied. Fully. Thank you, God. Fully satisfied. Fully. Full God, not half. Not half. Not half. Not half. Not half. 100%. We hold nothing, nothing back. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. I surrender, Lord, to you. Everything I give to you, withholding 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 nothing withholding nothing we will not let family we will not let money we will not let possessions we will not let prestige we will not let titles we will not let anything so when we say Christ over everything, we mean Christ over everything. Everything. Thank you for sanctifying us today. Thank you for calling us holy today. Thank you for positioning our feet to stand in paths of righteousness today. Thank you for massaging those hard-hearted places and giving us a heart that is honorable to you. We appreciate you, Lord. We thank you, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you give the Lord a praise?